Coming up next on Arizona PBS, life and world. Hi, Michael Crow here, President of ASU. Everyone should know that lifelong learning is going to be an essential ingredient to you and your family's success. I'm really proud that Arizona PBS and Arizona State University are working together in every possible way to make certain that you, through the PBS uh, network here and our station here, can have access to all that you need to move your family forward in terms of gaining access to learning over your entire lifetime. No matter what your age, no matter where you are, no matter where you're sitting, no matter what you're doing, we are here for you, and we're really excited about that. Arizona PBS celebrates Arizona history with a moment in time, made possible by Whitfield Nursery. Charles T. Hayden is credited with being the founder of Tempe and Arizona State University. Mill Avenue in Tempe is named after the Hayden Flour Mill, originally built by Hayden in 1874. Coming soon to Arizona PBS. In Eureka Springs, Arkansas, Drag queens and Christians share the stage. We're getting too permissive in this town. We're old Christian ladies. That's how we roll. <laughs> Love and faith collide in one hell of a show. The Gospel of Eureka. All new, Monday night at 11.30 on Arizona PBS. When you want to be more informed, Arizona PBS delivers news and analysis with multiple perspectives. Thanks to financial support from you and... Friendship Village Tempe. A retirement community for over 30 years offers independent living with residency options, lifelong learning classes, as well as continuing care. Information at FriendshipVillageAZ.com. From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Coming up, we tell you about a monument near the Woodbury Fire and what crews are doing to protect the prehistoric cliff dwellings. And tomorrow marks the 75th anniversary of the GI Bill, how an Arizona man's mission to help veterans influence the legislation. Also, lawmakers putting aside politics for a game of softball. It's all for a great cause. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Gabriela Collage. And I'm Kevin Thompson. Thank you for joining us. As the Woodbury fire continues to burn, resources are being used throughout the state to combat the flames. Along with containing the fire itself, members assigned to the fires have also taken steps in preserving the Tonto National Monument. Reporter Tanaya Williamson has more on what that process looks like. Tanaya, what can you tell us? As the massive fire continues to grow, officials are doing whatever they can to try and protect the forest from potentially devastating damage. As the Woodbury fire exploded to nearly 66,000 acres overnight and continued to head north, officials are doing what they can to preserve one of Arizona's national treasures that is in the line of fire. They have been working on preservation efforts for about a week or so, even before the fire made any movement. Krista Sadler says those in charge of the Tonto National Monument have done their best to work ahead and prepare for what may come. The monument kind of took precautionary steps to make sure that we would have enough time to protect the cliff dwellings and remove all of the artifacts from our visitor center museum. Sadler says that help in preserving the 700-year-old Salado cliff dwellings, which are protected by the monument, has come from all over the state. This includes hotshot crews from Casa Grande and Flagstaff. We have also been working with the Western Archaeological Conservation Center out of Tucson, and they've been helping us clear all of the artifacts out of the visitor center, and they are safely secured and away from any path of the fire. As the fire continues to spread, Tiffany Davila with the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fires is urging people to be careful. We do have a lot of resources committed to the Woodbury Fire and other fires across the state. Um, so it's one of those things where we try to get out to the public to just please be proactive. Uh, we're seeing multiple fire starts every day, and our fire personnel are spread thin across the state. Uh, we don't need another Woodbury Fire. Davila says the state of Arizona has already seen hundreds of wildfires this year most of them caused by people. Um, we've had 701 wildfires to date this year. Uh, 672 of those fires were human caused. So you can see that's a big portion of the fires that are started by people. We'll have to assess the conditions of the monument after that time and kind of go from there. Um, but we're all supporting each other and doing what we can to get through the Woodbury fire. 
Forest officials have called for another community meeting today to keep residents informed about the massive blaze. It's set to begin at 6 p.m. at the Miami High School Auditorium in Miami. In the broadcast center, Tanaya Williamson, Cronkite News. Thanks, Tanaya. Tomorrow marks the 75th anniversary of the GI Bill, which provides veterans with funds for education and more. Cronkite News reporter Amanda Slee explains how an Arizona Navy veteran is partially responsible for that legislation. Ernest McFarland served as Arizona's governor in the 1950s. Before that, he was a U.S. Senator, a Democrat from the Grand Canyon State. But before his life in public office, he enlisted in the Navy during World War I. But severe pneumonia kept him from seeing active duty. He was then honorably discharged. He saw his fellow soldiers coming home and realized there was no support for them. That was something McFarland wanted to change. He wanted people to have more of an opportunity through education. John Lewis says that's why his grandfather helped create the GI Bill, which was signed into law in 1944. He saw what happened to our World War I veterans and how they were treated on Acosta Flats, and that just broke his heart. And he knew, because he was a World War I veteran, that when World War II's over, all these people are coming home from Europe and they're going to have nothing to do, no jobs. So he thought, hey, why don't we send them to school? And if they don't want to, they've got business loans to start a business or they can, you know, buy homes. McFarland was credited with writing the education part of the bill. Delbert Lewis Jr. is also a grandson of Ernest McFarland. He says early on he didn't realize how important his grandfather was. I kind of had an idea he was really famous and did some really important things, but it was kind of later on in life when I got to ride in a parade with him that I really realized, hey, this guy's big time. Over time, there has been additions to the GI Bill. As a veteran, if you wanted to go to Harvard, uh, for instance, you went to Harvard and the GI Bill paid for it. Or if you wanted to go to the normal school uh, here in Arizona, they would pay for that too. Now there's certain caps and restrictions on it. Veterans can also spread out their benefits. You are able to give percentages for any dependents, your spouse, your dependents, and you sort of transfer over time periods so that they can go to school during those time periods. Benefits used to expire after 10 years, but Wanda Wright says Congress changed that in 2017. Now we have the forever GI Bill, which never expires. And so those coming out now will have the opportunity to use that and we'll be able to use that pretty much for the rest of their lives. And all of this started with Ernest McFarland's work after World War II. I personally have had so many medical doctors that I had met, so many professors, both at ASU and U of A, that would say, if it weren't for the GI Bill, I would not be a professor today. And it's just helped many, many people a celebration honoring the GI Bill was held in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi attended the ceremony. She says the GI Bill has been instrumental in helping the lives of American veterans from one war era to the next. Amanda Slee, Cronkite News. We're taking another look at a story from our Borderland series at Cronkite News. Annika Abbott introduces us to Venezuelan refugee women who are struggling to provide for themselves and their families. La mujer que ha obtenido sus derechos. It's International Women's Day. People in Comas, a town on the outskirts of Lima, Peru, are celebrating at the government building in the town center. But on what should be a day of strength and empowerment, Venezuelan refugee women feel powerless. Yo tengo 72 años. Eh, nadie me da trabajo. No tengo medio de subsistencia. No quiero regresar a mi país por la misma situación país que tenemos. Over 700,000 Venezuelan refugees have immigrated to Peru in the past three years, overwhelming government and city resources where they are already scarce. A mainly informal economy and little government assistance make it hard for both locals and refugees, leaving nonprofits to pick up where the government leaves off. No hay para los niños pobres y ya quieres ayudar al venezolano. Mi discurso siempre ha sido, o sea, la, la incapacidad que tengamos nosotras como Estado 
para resolver nuestros propios problemas. Ya viene una situación bastante difícil, entonces encontrar un espacio, encontrar una casa que, da, que brinde acogida, que brinde un espacio para estar algunos días por lo menos seguro, que estar, eh, recibir una buena alimentación, recibir un lugar para descanso. Peru is still receiving over 1,000 Venezuelan refugees a day. Annika Abbott, Cronkite News, Lima, Peru. For more on Peru, join us next week to watch the next installment of our Borderlands series. And today marks the first official day of summer. Are you sure? Because it certainly felt like <laughs> it started before today. Ryan Sundin has our weekend forecast and what temperatures will look like next week. Ryan. This weekend's been going to be really good for Phoenix stands. We're only hitting 93 today, maybe jumping up to 100. Everywhere else is pretty much the same unless you go to the Grand Canyon. It's usually 20 degrees, a little bit downward. Tomorrow we're going to be hitting 98, so it's probably the best time of the weekend to go out unless it's you like to be hot. Tomorrow in the valley, we have 98, 95 at Deer Valley, and then at Cave Creek, it hits 93. So it's going to be a little bit nicer in the mountains as it usually is. But for the rest of the week, tomorrow, 98 is going to be the best day, in my opinion. And then we're going to just keep creeping up the rest of the week until we hit Friday at 109. So if you want to get out there, I would say go Saturday and Sunday. Live from the Weather Center, back to you guys. Well, let's take it outside is usually an invitation to a fight, but in Washington, where most of the fighting is done inside, it's a way for lawmakers to play nice at the annual Congressional Women's Softball Game. Julian Paras has our story from our Washington Bureau. Democrats and Republicans don't tend to agree on everything, especially when it comes to politics. But for one night, they put their differences aside, played on the same team, and raised money for a common cause. You know, the most important thing about tonight is to remember that we're raising funds for the Young Survivors Coalition to help young survivors of breast cancer. But the second most important thing to know is that we're going to beat the press tonight. <laughs> Every year, women in Congress battle women in the Washington Press Corps on the diamond, not just for bragging rights, but for the battle against breast cancer. Head organizer Adelie Ebersole said the game began with a member of Congress who was overcoming breast cancer herself. Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz started the game 11 years ago. She had breast cancer and uh, when she was 41 years old. And so after she got through treatment, she just really wanted to give back to something, to the community that really helped her. Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema has now played in seven consecutive games and says lawmakers have never had a problem coming together when they're on the field. There's no difficulty putting differences aside because we have more in common than we have apart, and we're all really good friends. Ebersole says the game is a charity event at its core, but also a personal one for many of the women on the field and in the stands. A lot of the players have been affected by breast cancer, um, either themselves or their family members, and so we just come out together tonight and we want to beat cancer. The final score was 10 to 3 with the press running victorious but a total of over $365,000 was raised in support for breast cancer survivors. In Washington, Julian Paras, Cronkite News. The Suns will have a distinctly different look next year thanks to a new head coach and a flurry of moves on draft day. Suns fans packed Thursday's draft party as the team made a series of trades. Forward Dario Saric coming to Phoenix along with North Carolina's Cameron Johnson, who was selected with the 11th pick. But Suns legend Alvin Adams said he believes the biggest impact will come from the team's new leader on the bench, Monty Williams. I know his reputation. I've had people calling me from around the league in so Oklahoma City and Portland saying, man, you got a great guy. They're a great coach. Some of the players talking about him, they're very anxious to start playing for him. We have so many young players. They made, they made progress last year, and uh, we're expecting a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot more progress this year. And, and of course, all of the Suns fans, want to, we want to be back in the playoffs, so that's the goal. Arizona ranks in the bottom five states in conditions for kids. That's according to the annual Kids Count Report released by the Annie E. Casey Foundation. The report looks at 16 areas of children's well-being. Arizona ranks 46 out of the 50 states, but the state is making strides in the areas of health, family, and education. The number of Arizona children without health insurance dropping to 8% in 2017, just a little over the national average. The rate of teen births fell nearly 50% from 2010 to 2017, and the number of 8th graders struggling in math down to 66% in 2017, which was better than the national average. 
One area the report found causing struggles for kids in Arizona is unstable housing. Cronkite News reporter Jesse Joe Pauly has more on where the state stands with housing affordability. Arizona kids are facing serious challenges, including keeping a roof over their heads. If a family spends more than 30% of their income on housing, it's considered a warning sign for future problems. It could also put them at risk for being squeezed out on other necessities. So not being able to buy school supplies, not being able to do after school activities, not being able to provide full nutrition because the family is spending so much on their housing. According to the Annie E. Casey Foundation's 2019 Kids Count Report, 32% of children in Arizona live in households with the high housing cost burden. That's just over the national average of 31%. Cameron Stevenson of the Arizona Housing Coalition explains why Arizona has lower affordability. We have laws specifically prohibiting cities and municipalities from creating affordable housing requirements. Uh, you know, for example, if, if a complex is building 100 units, they need to make sure 10 of them are eligible for affordable housing vouchers. Uh, we were one of the first states to make that illegal. The report also shows that given the history of discrimination in housing and employment in Arizona, children of color are more likely to face housing instability. More than one in five children in Arizona lives in poverty, and that, according to the Kids Count Report, is one of the greatest threats to children's success. But Dana Wolf Namark says she has hope for a better future, and if individuals want to make changes in Arizona, they should take action. Find a group that shares your own values. It's much more fun and powerful to work on issues together and not alone. For Cronkite News, I'm Jesse Jopali reporting. Last year, Arizona ranked 45th, so we've actually dropped one spot in rankings. If you were in downtown Phoenix this morning, you may have heard helicopters and saw an increased police presence. Cronkite News reporter Amanda Slee explains this was all part of a national security conference. Phoenix first responder teams are taking a break from the meetings and demonstrations inside to step into SWAT cars like this to do a terrorist demonstration outside. The scene is this. Phoenix first responders get intel that a small group of domestic terrorists are targeting a hospital. A suspect vehicle flies down 3rd Street outside the convention center and choppers land with SWAT teams rushing inside a nearby building. Phoenix Fire, hazmat crews, and a robot work the scene where the driver is stopped. Phoenix Fire Captain Rob McDade hopes this demonstration shows the public they don't need to worry. With your tax dollars that you use, that you pay, that we've got you protected and that indeed we, we do have a plan for anything, God forbid, that could happen. McDade also says it's important to be prepared. When you look at Phoenix, we're a city that hosts Final Fours, All-Star Games, and the Super Bowl. So we need to show them that for any major emergency that could happen, we're prepared for it. We're going to show them what we can do in a moment's notice because it happens so quickly. If there's a terrorist act, we need to show them that we are indeed prepared. The demonstration is part of the National Homeland Security Conference and it's brought public safety personnel together from around the world to network and share tips. You know, preparing here is, you know, talking, learning, collaborating, seeing what others are doing. So maybe it's not being done in your hometown, but now we take it back and we can start implementing whatever that action might be in your own hometown to make sure we're doing the best. In downtown Phoenix, Amanda Slee, Cronkite News. The exact tactics used to, used to secure the simulated terrorist vehicle were hidden from media cameras. That's because these tactics are meant to be kept confidential for security reasons. This summer, youth interested in law enforcement careers are able to get their feet wet in the Maricopa County Cadet Program before they are old enough to become sworn police officers. Cronkite News reporter Kevin Fleischman shows us what it takes. Uh, and then our K-9 division and then our bomb squad. So all of us together every time we get called out to a search warrant. This cadet academy keeps many young adults focused and out of trouble, says Maricopa County Sheriff Deputy Rob Merritt. A lot of times, uh, young men and women that want to go into law enforcement, they slip up somewhere between 18 and 21. Programs like this keep them on that straight and narrow, so when they do turn 21, they're ready to go right into it and, and hit it head on. Protecting others motivates many of the cadets. I think a lot of these kids truly like the structure. Um, the command structure that is involved with with uh, the program. Um, I think they 
a lot of them, if you ask them, they want to help people. In the program, cadets work as a team and learn firearm safety, self-defense tactics, and CPR training. It can be physically demanding. One of the best things is you see the confidence building over the, the entire two weeks. Um, if we would have put them in some of these situations nine days ago, they would have probably turned around and said, I'm, I'm done. All of the 22 cadets who started the academy made it to the end. In Phoenix, Kevin Fleischman, Cronkite News. This is the third year the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office has offered this training. For more information, you can visit mcsocadets.com. Arizona will get $100,000 to help ex-prisoners find work. The Department of Labor only gave 24 states grant money. The goal is to keep ex-offenders from returning to prison by helping them secure employment. One program that's been helping inmates transition into the workforce is through Hickman's Family Farm. For decades, the farm has offered prison inmates the opportunity to work while incarcerated. The company recently expanded that program by giving inmates a place to live and work once they're released. We learn more in a piece produced by Nick Serpa, Skyliana Dosier, Heather Ayrsey, and Justin Stoneking. I would say about 90% of the people that are here come from a similar background and they all share one thing in common and, and that is that they were in prison at one point. Like people that are coming out of prison a lot of times they feel like the world is watching me because I still have this stigma like over my head or you know I still feel like I'm an outsider. Yeah. I love you baby. I love you too. You know, you see a lot of guys that come out and right out the bat they're homeless and they're trying to f find, you know, a, a place of stability. Um, and then that's, that doesn't even include finding employment. Hickman's Family Farms is probably the largest egg producer on the West Coast, producing about 10 million eggs a day. We have the group of inmates that are currently working at Hickman's during their incarceration. When those inmates get released, we try to do whatever we can to retain that employment. And a lot of those inmates that come out end up here in, in our transitional living community. You're gonna get your first key assigned to you, huh? Yeah, first one in you. I still have your old keys at home. Let's just go see. Oh, it's cute, huh? Cute. The year and a half before I got arrested, I kind of took a, a turn for the worst. I've always been responsible and handled my life very well. I took care of my responsibilities and my kids. Uh, the person I was before was very angry, very mean, um, just selfish and self-centered. You know, doctors prescribe prescription painkillers for just about anything and I was really in a depressed state and got addicted and I, I caused a lot of damage. Going to prison that time definitely opened my eyes to needing to fix the mental health problems before everything else. I'm still very nervous and anxious and I'm shaky, a little overwhelmed, but it's all good feelings. I'm happy and I just want to start rebuilding. What is your favorite part of this apartment? The bed. <laughs> It's the favorite, my favorite part of the apartment is the bed. While I was incarcerated, I worked for Hickman's. Um, I worked a retention job. I ended up leaving with over $10,000. Leaving prison with money was huge. I even sent child support home when I was in prison, which is something I could not have done without this inmate program. When I ended up getting employed in prison with Hickman's, uh, my ex-husband had needed help with the bills and it felt really good to be in prison and to be able to say, I can pay those for you. The first moment Aaron told me those apartments were ready, I think my things were already packed. Getting out of prison, your family's a little bit standoffish. They want to make sure that you're not going to make the same mistakes that you made going in. And the reason why they were okay with the Hickman housing is because they offer counseling, a work program, it's right there on site. The best support I have are the people around here. There's so many good people here just striving to get their life back. If I bring someone in here, 
I want them to be as successful. Like, I want them to go, like, to the moon if possible. I can say to myself, like, oh, wow, like, that person was really worth helping. You know, make good decisions and good things will happen. It's true. Everything has fallen into place. Mine and my husband's relationship. Since I've been out, we actually look for things to fight about, and we just can't do it. <laughs> What drives me now is I have goals. I have so many goals and I just, I really, my kids are pushing me. I want my family back. That's the most important thing to me. I have three little boys that need their mom and they are my drive, they're my motivation and they're gonna keep pushing me to go. So, oh and I'm gonna cry. <laughs> Hickman's Farms does ask employees to put about 20% of their pay towards housing up to $400 a month. Tattoos are like pieces of art, and just like paintings, are produced with different paints. Tattoos can be created with different ink. Reporter Grayson Schmidt captures a growing trend in the tattoo community, vegan ink. And a lot of vegans don't get tattoos because they, th they say, oh, it's full of animal products, you know, and this and that, but it's, it's, it's starting to become more normal in the tattoo industry. My name is Luis Marufo. I've been tattooing a um, little over three years. Yeah, so vegan ink um, is an ink that doesn't contain um, any glycerin, animal stabilizers. Um, a lot of black inks contain like uh, the wings of, sh of a shellac beetle. Um, so it's got bugs in it. Uh, different pigments have different kind of bugs depending on where, where they get them from. A lot of colors have, have different pigments. And the ink I use is carbon-based. So it's a carbon-based only. A lot of black ink is made from animal bones. So they char it down, they burn it to a complete crisp and they use that powder as a pigment for the ink. I don't use any colored inks because a lot of them contain uh, toxins and chemicals as well. In the colored inks, the black is a very basic ink you can use. So I use black only for all my tattoos. I find a lot of my clients like to come here even if they're not vegan. They like to come to me because it's a cleaner way of getting a tattoo. It heals much faster. It looks a lot better over time because uh, it's just the, the way it heals has a lot to do with how the longevity of the tattoo, you know, how is it going to look five years from now. To be honest, vegan ink is actually in the market now. It's, it's one of the primary inks that people use in a lot of shops. Tattoos, they say, is a permanent thing, and like, to me, a tattoo has to have meaning, right? And so, Kind of like the first one that I got, you know, it had its own middle meaning, but I didn't think about like what it was as far as the ink itself. So the idea of that there being animal product in it, like a, something that kind of came from a, a violent background, was going on my body permanently, was just didn't settle right. A lot of old school shops, it's you kind of don't know what they're using. They might be using different inks, you know, a lot of old school tattooers use the old inks that they used to use, but there's a lot of vegan options out there. Aside from Marufo, there are two other verified vegan tattoo artists in the Valley and one in Tucson. On the next Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable. We will have more on utilities being ordered to stop shutting off power during the hot summer months. And the governor wants to expand the state school voucher program. It's the next Journalists' Roundtable. Henry Slaughter, the CEO of New America. We're a distinctive community of problem solvers and storytellers who are committed to American renewal. I'd like to invite you to watch our new show, Innovating the Future, a joint production with Arizona State University. We'll talk with experts, analysts, and activists about the challenges our nation faces and the opportunity for solutions. So join us for Innovating the Future. Tonight at 7.30 on Arizona PBS. On Finding Your Roots, Senator Marco Rubio. That's amazing. I didn't even believe any of this stuff existed. Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. This is really cool. <laughs> and former Congressman Paul Ryan. Nobody in my entire family knows any of this stuff. How's that make you feel? Honored. Finding Your Roots. Tonight at 8 on Arizona PBS. Explore new ideas and new worlds here on Arizona PBS. A community service of Arizona State University. See this flower garden? 
There used to be a car sitting there, a car I didn't use and didn't want. So I donated it to public television, and they took care of everything. In addition to supporting my favorite programs, I earned a tax deduction. Turn something you don't need into something you really want. Contact the Vehicle Donation Program. Coming up next on Arizona PBS, life and world. Your favorite PBS shows, ready to watch when you are, anytime, any place. Find more ways to explore than ever before. Arizona PBS celebrates Arizona history with a moment in time, made possible by Rock Springs Cafe. The iconic Rossen House in downtown Phoenix was built in the 1890s. The house is now protected under the U.S. National Register of Historic Places. Coming soon to Arizona PBS. I'm Jose Cardenas, host of Horizonte. Each week, we bring you experts and community leaders to discuss the issues that are vital to our community here in Arizona. We cover the stories that affect and inspire us and our families and talk to the newsmakers who shape the communities where we live. Horizonte is your source and your voice for what matters most here on Arizona PBS. Support for Arizona PBS comes from viewers like you and from the Persian Room. Travel to another world, to a land of exotic aromas and period decor for a fine dining experience. The Persian Room in North Scottsdale on Scottsdale Road, one light north of Frank Lloyd Wright Boulevard. Gourmet exotic cuisine at its best. I'm Susan Linkus of the Linkus Group, a fee-based registered investment advisor specializing in financial planning, investment management, insurance strategies, and more. LinkusGroup.com, investing for life. Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, the State Corporation Commission bans utilities from shutting off power during hot